Peeps, in the last video we talked about the requirements of a CHP and we said there were 12 of them and we said that these 12 components are really to put you first but we could care less if you're a student. But if you're a worker, we were going to put you first. How can we minimize your exposure to chemicals? How can we ensure that you are taking the necessary steps to limit your exposure? And then what is the employer doing? to get rid of the exposures if they happen, right? Okay, so in this video, we're gonna continue on with this discussion of a CHP. So first, it is a tool that is used to protect workers. So as an employee, you should be very happy that a CHP has to be implemented. It's putting you first or at least it should. It's telling the employer what they can and cannot do and what you can and cannot be exposed to. And if you have to be exposed to it, what are they doing to minimize your exposure? So they're putting your safety first. That's why we call it a safety plan. Something else about the CHP is that it has to be available to all employees. And I'm going to put here, easily available. So as a worker, can you go on a website or can you go somewhere at the facility and retrieve the chemical hygiene plan? So think about this for a second. Maybe you're taking this and you are employed by Cape Fear. You fall under an employee. If you are working in a laboratory or if you are working in an area that has chemicals around it, OSHA could come in and they could say, hey, could you show us where your CHP is at? And if you were not able to do that, is it your fault or is it the employer's fault? What about your coworker? Maybe they're working at the college too. Could you look to the person next to you and say, do you know where to find our chemical hygiene plan? And if they say, what is that? The college could be in serious violation. Or if you're a laboratory worker, a work-study student, and you're coming into our laboratory or another laboratory or somewhere else on campus that have chemicals. And OSHA comes and says, oh, you're a work-study student. Where's the chemical hygiene plan? That probably doesn't look good on the college either. Someone's going to get in trouble. If you cannot find the chemical hygiene plan easily or worse yet you don't even know what a chemical hygiene plan is then we are in serious violation now if you're a student who cares we don't care if you even know what a chemical hygiene plan is I do of course I want you to know what does a CHP stand for normal students could care less I want you to know though that's the whole purpose kind of of a program in a way to expose yourself to these kind of things, right? This is real world stuff here. So this is going to be a problem. For that reason, most of the time, the CHPs are going to be online. You should be able to go to a website. You should be able to type in chemical hygiene plan, Cape Fear Community College, and it should automatically pop up you should easily be able to find this document. Not only that, but this document can also be printed and it can be placed in the laboratories or laboratory spaces throughout the campus or throughout the facility. The same thing should happen to an employer. As a lab worker, if you're currently working for a lab right now, and some of you might be, well, you're you have the possibility of getting exposed. Your rules are the same as ours. Can you go 
and find your company's chemical hygiene plan without a problem. If you can't, then we have some issues. Something else that you got to think about is that institutions, they are not the same. So CHPs can look different. Yes, we have these 12 components that are kind of a requirement. But we've already said before, well, just because they're a requirement doesn't mean that they have to be full-bodied. Some actually relate to some labs more than they relate to others. So because of that, there's different approaches. There are different things that we've got to look at. There's different things that we're going to place a focus on. So CHPs can look different. This is okay. No big deal there. It's okay. As long as they're kind of in the format that they need to be in, OSHA's good. CHPs can take a variety of approaches to comply with OSHA regulations. No big deal. And OSHA knows that. That means, looking different, details. Some sections might have more details than others. We've talked about this already. Content. Some sections might not even have a content section. It just might say not applicable. We really don't have to worry about that here. Presentation. Some people like to make chemical hygiene plans very pretty. Uh, others could care less what it looks like. They're not really concerned with that. There's no regulations or requirements on that either. They can be as detailed as they need to be or as lean as they need to be. At the same time, looking different also means specific laboratories might have very specific tests that they do. And these are very common. And these specific tests, again, it's all focused on hazardous chemicals. That's what we're really worried with here. The hazardous chemicals that are used for this common test, this can be very detailed in the CHP. That way, if someone is doing this test and someone's getting exposed to this chemical, it specifically states what they should be doing and how they should be handling it and how they should be disposing of it throughout the process. Because of that, different departments, whether it's an employer or whether it's at the academic institution, can have their own CHP in place. Meaning that the chemistry department could have their own CHP, the biology department could have their own chemical hygiene plan, and the chemical technology department could have our own chemical hygiene plan. Nothing says that only one document is okay. If this is a smaller college, then yeah, maybe one document would suffice for everything. But the larger the institution, the more faculty members are at play, the larger the lab spaces, the differences in the chemical storages and waste all play a factor. And larger academic institutions and larger employers, if they have multiple labs on site, will typically have their own chemical hygiene plan. They could work under the same template. That's okay. But things and details would be very specific to their department and what they're doing. Okay. Now, we've mentioned a chemical hygiene officer, a CHO. One, at least, has to be appointed. So if you're currently working in a laboratory, you should have a CHO. If not, you better get one because it is a requirement of OSHA. Now, the CHO can be a person, just one poor little person that has to control all of it. And that's okay for really small labs, no big spaces, not a lot of employees. You know, everything is typically maintained pretty well. One chemical hygiene officer is okay. 
But this also could be a committee, a group of people. If this is a large lab or a large employer or a large academic institution, sometimes a whole committee has to be appointed. And the reason is because a committee makes up of different people, right? And you can have one person assigned to each area. So if I'm working for a pharmaceutical company, maybe I am assigning one CHO, uh, who knows, to the HPLC labs, one to the GC labs, one to the dissolution labs, one to the processing laboratories. Or if I'm an academic institution, I could say, well, I've got one representative from chemistry, one from biology, one from cosmetology. Maybe there's hazardous waste there. Who knows? Maybe we can't pour everything down the drain. One in boat building. We've got chemicals there too, right? Some of those can't just be dumped down the drain. Some of those could be classified as hazardous. So this is a lab standard requirement. You have to have one. If you don't know who the CHO is, then you're in big trouble. Who do you ask? Who do you report to? If you do have questions in your area, what's the person's name? Do you know that? If not, your employer or your college is not doing you any justice. If OSHA comes in and says, hey, you've worked here for this company for about six months. Who's your chemical hygiene officer? And you don't know? Mm, I don't think your boss is going to be very happy. Or, hey, you've worked at this college for six years. Who's your chemical hygiene officer? And you cannot report that name? OSHA begins to question everything that the company's doing. So, colleges. Who's typically the CHO? Well, depending on how these colleges are set up, in our circumstance, maybe, maybe not, a lot of times it's the department chair. So, for instance, in a normal university, a department chair, let's say chemistry, you would have a chemistry department chair. That chemistry department chair would be the CHO, and they would represent everything that needs to be known about the chemical hygiene plan for all of their faculty. Now, department chairs at Cape Fear are a little different. Department chairs at Cape Fear, they just don't really specialize in one area. If you take a look at our department chair, we've got engineering and public services all mixed in together. So our department chair is not only in charge of chemical technology, but also for cosmetology and culinary maybe, right? So how on earth is that department chair going to know the chemical hygiene plan for our laboratories? They don't. So sometimes that makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. That just really depends on the academic institution. Not only department chair, but deans can also be flopped into the CHO category. Deans could also be held responsible. And sometimes what we would call directors. Directors would be responsible for the CHO or CHP as well. Uh, sometimes academic institutions, they can just randomly pick somebody. That's okay. No one says they have to be department chairs or deans or program directors. But the person that you pick better know what they're talking about. Meaning that if OSHA comes and does a site visit and says, hey, we would like to talk to your CHO about the chemical technology lab. And then that CHO, a randomly picked person, shows up and OSHA says, yeah, we've noticed this silver waste that's getting generated in the laboratory. Could you tell us what you're using silver for? And that CHO doesn't know how to answer that. We have a problem. Or, yeah, this silver waste is getting generated. You might not know why they're using it, but how are we getting rid of it? And the CHO cannot answer that. You've got a bigger problem. So you have to make sure that the CHO at your location, at your employer, even if it's at a college, understands everything that there is to know about the spaces. 
specifically with hazardous waste. What waste is getting generated? How are you getting rid of it? How are you minimizing exposure? That's really what it's all about. In addition, the CHO has some responsibilities. The chemical hygiene officer should constantly update the chemical hygiene plan. If your chemical hygiene plan has not been updated in years, there's an issue. It should at least be reviewed. It should at least be updated or maintained. And OSHA really encourages at least every six months. You know, there's turnaround at companies. Who's responsible? Whose names should be included in the chemical hygiene plan? Uh, laboratory spaces, have they been moved? What about inventory list of hazardous chemicals? Yes or no? Employers are the same way, right? Just as academics are. So every six months, this thing should go back. You should review it, make sure it's still okay. If there's no changes at all, you should at least update the review date, last reviewed on, and put the date on there. That way OSHA knows that you are constantly looking at the information that's contained in this document to make sure that it is updated with the most current information. CHPs, OSHA requires that they have the training and experience necessary for their job. Again, if they do a SOT visit and they begin to ask your chemical hygiene officer questions, if they don't know what the heck they're talking about and they don't know basic terminology of waste and disposal and exposure limits, then that is not a proper chemical hygiene officer that you need to be using. Never pick someone that's never worked in a lab right? If you're picking someone that's never worked in a lab that has no clue about hazardous waste or chemicals or personal protective equipment, that person should not be your CHO. Now, that person can be the head of a CHO committee. That way, if OSHA comes in and OSHA begins to go to maybe a biology lab and begins to ask questions about biology-specific reagents, then you can send the person that is assigned to that area to represent the institution or the employer. That's the great thing about a committee. The whole committee can go around with OSHA as they do their SOT visit. And as they go into the different areas and as they have questions, the person that is assigned that specific area can be able to answer those. One person is not responsible for everything. That's always the best case scenario, right? But again, smaller institutions, they might not need the whole committee. One person might be enough. Smaller employers, same way. If it's just one little lab and one little room, why do you need a whole committee on it? One person should be in charge of that. One person should be enough. So the lab standard requires, requires that the chemical hygiene officer has the training and experience to provide guidance. Guidance to the OSHA for their questions or state agencies if they show up. Guidance to the employer or to the college if something needs to be maintained or changed. They are the go-to person. So again, their role is very important. As an employee of any academic institution, of any industry, of any lab, you should know who your chemical hygiene officer is. Okay, now, with that said, if I'm a secretary at a company, I might not need to know who my chemical hygiene officer's at. I'm not going to be exposed to that, right? That's not my job. 
if I'm an English faculty member, well, I probably could care less who my chemical hygiene officer is, right? I'm not exposed to any type of chemical. I'm not exposed to anything that's hazardous in my workplace, at least on a normal day. So it's okay if I don't really know who the CHO is. But if I'm working in a laboratory environment, if I'm working with chemicals that are deemed hazardous that I can't just pour down the drain or throw into the trash can, then it is my responsibility to know who the chemical hygiene officer is going to be. So keep that in mind when you get a job or if you're already working in those environments, keep that in mind if you don't know who that person is already. So the next video will continue on and uh, we might even finish up in the next video.